Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. This podcast is sponsored by the Soothe app. We all know how stressful investing in volatile markets can be. That's why I use Soothe. Soothe delivers five-star certified massage therapists to your home, office, or hotel in as little as an hour. They bring everything you need for a relaxing spa experience without the hassle of traveling to a spa. Podcast listeners can enjoy 30 bucks to their first Soothe massage with the promo code MEB. Just download the Soothe app and insert the code before booking. Happy relaxation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're here in a rainy and foggy Los Angeles morning. Today, we have an incredibly special guest, Professor Ed Thorpe. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So we have a little bit of a younger audience, uh, a lot of younger quants. And so just a real super quick intro for those who aren't familiar. I'm just going to provide the briefest back backgrounds, and then we're going to hop in because we have so much to cover today. So Ed is a total self-made man. He's been a professor, renowned mathematician, a fund manager who's posted one of the best track records in all of finance, best-selling author, creator of the world's first wearable computer, and finally a successful gambler, two words you normally don't hear together. And if you had to pick investors for the Mount Rushmore of investing, Ed would be on there with the likes of Simons and Buffett. And oddly enough, he would probably be on the Mount Rushmore of gambling too, and certainly the only one on both. So Ed has just written a great new book, his memoir titled A Man for All Markets. Lots of fun stories. Don't want to spoil it. So let's jump right in. Ed, I thought we could start where you do in your book. So back in Chicago and in SoCal in the 1930s, you were born a child of the Depression. You know, my father was actually born around the same time on a farm in Nebraska, no running water, outhouse, all that good stuff. And I saw it kind of color his entire life, the way he thought about things, the way he approached not only his career, but investing. So maybe it'd be a good start to talk a little bit about how that, how you thought that, ex that experience affected your personality and, and in general worldview growing up. Well, I was born in the depths of the depression actually i think the dow touched its lowest point in july of 1932 and i was born in august of 1932 so it was uh, uphill all the way but bumpy in the stock market and people were very poor then very much like uh, you picture people in uh, the streets of moscow when i was there in 1972 uh, dower drab clothing Everything was precious. Everything was saved and used. And uh, there was 25% unemployment. So it was, a, it was a grim time in the history of the country. We finally got uh, bailed out, so to speak, with World War II. So I experienced all that. And that uh, gave me a perspective on later events that I think aren't, aren't shared or appreciated as much by uh, people who are uh, much younger. And, and so you had to scrap a little bit. You had to take on a few jobs. I think uh, you, you you had the, what, two, four in the morning newspaper route as well, right? Yeah, when I, when my family moved to California in 1942, I was about uh, a little over 10 then, I got to work delivering newspapers at 2 or 3 a.m. in order to make uh, a little extra money. And I was going to a high school, which was academically not particularly good. It was ranked 31 out of 32 in the LA city school system. So nobody there went to college, but I was interested in science, math, literature, quite a few things. So I ended up earning money to buy science equipment and also learned how to teach myself things. And that 
uh, stood me well in later life, the learning how to think for myself and to teach myself. And in teaching yourself, I think you know, I remember the book, even you referencing making your own gunpowder, nitroglycerin. Is, is, is that right? Yes. When I learned something uh, theoretical in science, I also tried to put it to work. I made explosives, gunpowder, nitroglycerin, uh, gun cotton, and uh, shot off rockets and that sort of thing. And, you know, it's funny. I, I come from a family of engineers on both sides. And my mom tells a funny story about my uncles who had built pipe bombs and then had set one off and then buried one in the backyard in North Carolina. And then my grandfather years later had unearthed it and thought it was some big plot and that someone was bearing bombs in his backyard. And so had called the police. And I think it even escalated a few levels above that. And uh, eventually, I think my uncles told him many, many decades later. But, um, you know, it's it's interesting because there's often a time a link between bright kids and and sort of getting into mischief. And you're a bit of a prankster, too. I mean, and, and there's a whole handful of kind of humorous pranks you had kind of pulled when you were a younger guy. Is there is there any one in particular that sticks out as is particular uh, one, one of your favorites? Well, I uh, one of them that uh, got a fair amount of press, there was a large indoor swimming pool in Long Beach called The Plunge. And it was part of an amusement park area down there. So I used to go down sometimes, uh, catch the bus when I was a teenager, and go down with myself uh, by myself or with a friend and look around and argue with people at one of the outdoor places called the Spit and Argue Club, where people would hold forth for 15 minutes on any topic. So I, I learned how to reason against people who believed in the flat earth society, that sort of thing. Well, anyhow, uh, when I was learning chemistry, I came across a dye called aniline red. And this dye could color six million times its own weight, uh, a deep blood red. So I put a little pinch in the goldfish pool in my backyard, and it turned it uh, a deep blood red. And I went back to my little chem lab behind the garage that I had uh, installed there. And I heard a lot of screaming. My mother had come out and saw that the pool was blood red, and she thought I was in there somewhere. So I calmed her down, and I thought about it a little more and said, well, this could lead to a really fun prank. So I went down with a confederate that I'd recruited to the Long Beach Plunge, and we put a little bag of aniline red in the pool that was sealed with wax, and we had some strings tied to it so we could tear it apart. And we walked to the sides of the pool, and a swimmer came by and stretched the strings, and unleashed the dye, and we got out and uh, dried off, ran upstairs to see what would happen. And there was a large red cloud that had formed. People began to scream, and a hero dove in and stirred it all up to, uh, in an attempt to rescue whoever was, was bleeding to death in the middle of this red cloud. And then finally they realized that as the cloud dispersed, there was nobody there. But the pool turned kind of a Kool-Aid, uh, red Kool-Aid color, and everybody basically bailed out and they all got their arms stamped and they left. We came back in the afternoon and not many people had trickled back. And then the next day there was an article in the newspaper about pranksters dying the Long Beach plug, plunge red. So that was very entertaining to me. That's funny. My, my, my favorite go-to growing up was the old school sink that had the little spray nozzle next to the to, to the main nozzle and I used to put rubber bands around it so that anytime anybody would come into the kitchen would get get hosed down um, problem with that one is that it's much easier to get caught because there's only a few culprits <laughs> than than the pool so it, one quick question and so we had asked on Twitter we said hey we're having Ed on tomorrow anybody have any good questions we got all sorts of questions but one that I thought was interesting we may include a few as we go along and says you know a lot of people likely look up to you quants gamblers as you know kind of their either or mentor was there anyone that you know as a child you know in in middle high school growing up that you looked looked up to as sort of a role model you know it in, in any field or any any sort of regard well my parents were busy working in defense industries during the war and uh, for some years afterwards and so one was working swing shift, the other was working graveyard. So they were either working or sleeping. I saw very little of them. So I kind of raised myself, but I had a wonderful English teacher at uh, Narbonne High School in Lomita who uh, sort of took me under his wing. He's, he saw the results of my IQ tests and sort of honed in on me as somebody who had promise. 
in any case, he was uh, almost like a second parent or a replacement for my uh, parents. And uh, so I learned a lot from him. And it was probably a lot due to his nurturing that I uh, focused as much as I did. You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's, so, there's so many commonalities. I remember my father, same sort of thing, was had no intentions of going to college. Um, and, and if it wasn't for one teacher, I mean, I think he was the first in his, in his family to ever go to school. Um, same sort of thing. If it wasn't for one teacher that had kind of encouraged him along and ended up similar to you. So you had, you had received a scholarship to Berkeley, eventually transferred to UCLA. We'll mention it later, but uh, ended up being a professor at MIT, New Mexico State, UC Irvine, all these good things. But I want to skip forward a little bit to age 26. You're out of school, I assume in grad school at this point. But let's talk about your first Vegas experience. And this was with Blackjack. And I think you had gone to Vegas and with what we would today call a basic strategy system, which is sort of the the basics. You know, you can't really beat the casino, but you're probably not going to lose a whole lot. And apparently that first time there was a, a fair amount of ridicule from other players in this experience. So I was wondering if you could talk about that or, or why, uh, why, why that was the case. Sure. Everything you say is uh, on the mark. What happened was I got a bachelor's and a master's in physics. And then while finishing my PhD in physics, uh, it was all done except for the last part of my thesis. I ran into a lot of math problems. It was in quantum mechanics. So I started taking more math courses. And then I realized that UCLA was slow graduating people in physics, but math was uh, relatively quick. So I changed to math to get my PhD sooner. So it happened quickly enough so that I wasn't able to apply for a job immediately. So I was kept on for another year as an instructor at UCLA while my thesis advisor helped me get a good placement, which turned out to be MIT. During that year, I went over Christmas vacation to Las Vegas. It was uh, Christmas 1958, because we didn't have any money. And they had uh, good accommodations at low prices and uh, also cheap food. And I happened to hear about a system in blackjack that had been uh, generated by four army mathematicians. Uh, that's the way they passed their three years at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And they had worked out a way to play blackjack almost even. A casino would have about a six tenths of a percent edge, they thought. Uh, their work was approximate, so that wasn't an exact number. It turned out to be that the casino and the player were just about dead even using the strategy they had generated, but uh, no one knew that at the time. So I took their strategy along with me, sat down at a blackjack table, and decided I'd risk $10. The reason I was willing to do that was because I had figured out how to beat roulette, and I knew that I'd be having to learn about how to play in casinos and get some exposure to the uh, environment in a casino. In any case, I played for about 20 minutes with a little strategy card and everybody thought it was ridiculous. And then the card caused me to destroy a good hand, uh, I think it was an ace and a seven, and keep drawing cards. And I finally got a terrible hand, I got 12 or 13, and 14, 16, I kept drawing. And then I ended up with a seven card 21. And they all thought this was wonderful, that uh, this was an amazing strategy and they thought it was a, a fool strategy before. So I learned from this that the players, at least in that little group, didn't understand the game. And the people in the casino didn't understand because once I had drawn the seven card 21, they all wanted to see what was going on with the card and they all uh, changed from ridicule to respect. I went back to UCLA and grabbed the article written by the so-called four horsemen, uh, the mathematicians from Aberdeen Proving Ground, and began to read it. And I realized uh, almost immediately that as cards were played, the composition of the deck changed often quite radically. And so the odds would change often quite radically in favor of the casino or the player. So that was my inspiration. And now the question was how to actually make this into a practical system. So I thought about that and got to work on it. And, and so it's interesting because you had said in the book, there's a great quote, you said, had I been more knowledgeable about the history of gambling and the centuries of effort devoted to the mathematical analysis of games, 
I might not have tackled blackjack. And it was only once you sat down with the players, one, saw how rational they were, but then also went back, thought about it a little bit. And, th- and this is kind of a great comment on, I think, interdisciplinary work where a lot of the status quo and a lot of what people think to be you know, correct. It often takes someone from a somewhat skewed or totally different discipline to think about it in a different way. So, all right. So you started thinking about moving cards, card counting, which is what people describe it as today. Uh, maybe just give a super quick summary of how that works on, on the most basics. Uh, so the listeners can understand how you then implemented it going forward. Okay. What I found out when I first attacked the problem by hand and then by uh, computer after I moved to MIT. They had a new IBM 704 computer that I could use uh, along with 30 New England universities. So pretty crowded. Um, what I found out was that if you took small cards out of the deck, that shifted the odds fairly strongly in favor of the player. If you took big cards out of the deck, aces and tens, that shifted the odds fairly strongly in favor of the casino. Uh, if you reverse that, A deck rich in big cards is good for the player. A deck poor in big cards is bad for the player. Uh, The mirror image is a deck rich in small cards is bad for the player. A deck rich in, uh, a deck poor in small cards is good for the player. So um, the point count that came out of all this was you start with a count of zero, aces and tens, when they fall, are minus one each, so you you start counting down if you see aces and tens going out. If small cards go out, those are two, three, four, five, and six. Then you add one to your count for each small card that goes out. And seven, eights, and nines are are fairly neutral, so you don't bother to count them, they're just zeros. And so the count goes up and down as you see cards during the play, and when the count gets positive enough, then you bet fair amount and when it gets negative you bet small just to keep your seat or you get up and leave or change tables so that's that's the root idea and that worked very well initially and still works now in those casinos that haven't uh, messed the rules up so there's a couple interesting points I, I, I want to talk about. And so you eventually started implementing this. You had um, some interesting, to say the least, partners um, that funded you with some money. And you started implementing it, won some money. And what probably every entrepreneur in the country would think is a somewhat crazy decision then decided to publish the work. Um, what you know? What, uh, and one of the <laughs> most often asked questions on Twitter is said, "Why didn't Ned just keep this to himself, the secret algorithm, and make a gazillion dollars and never tell the world?" What's uh, what was your what was your thinking there? Well, I was academically oriented. The ideal life for me was to be a full professor at a good university and have all kinds of smart friends and work on interesting problems. So. To me, this was an interesting problem that I was curious about. And the spirit in science is to share what you find out. So to share my ideas was uh, almost automatic. However, I ended up actually going to the casinos to play because when I announced the strategy that I developed, there was a lot of ridicule, both from um, newspapers and from Las Vegas and Reno especially. So the state of Nevada said this is ridiculous. There is no such thing as a winning system. By the way, mathematicians had thought there was no such thing either. But when I explained how it worked at a meeting of the American Math Society, then they they caught on and they understood uh, what was going on and they realized that it was right. So anyhow, I ended up accepting a bankroll offer from two very wealthy uh, citizens and we went out to Lake Tahoe and Reno for a, a test of the system that was in spring break at MIT 1961. And we took along $10,000. They wanted to take $100,000 along, but that was too much uh, in uh, my view because if something went wrong, something might go wrong with me. So anyhow, um, but you might add a zero to these numbers approximately because of inflation. A uh, dollar then is worth about $8.00 close to 10. Now, I played for about 40 hours. About 20 hours was uh, warm up and getting used to everything. And about 20 hours was serious uh, 50 to five, $500 betting. 
And I predicted that we double our bankroll and we actually made $11,000 after it was all over instead of the 10,000 I predicted. So everything performed the way I said it was going to. We were never behind more than 1,300. So that was the beginning. We're going to skip over the some some. You have some awesome stories in the book, including one of my favorites, which is how you communicated your earnings to your wife uh, over the fun. But listeners, you got to go read the book to get all these. Um, but but here's a question I I wanted to ask. And so you know, a lot of people once it goes from theory to real world implementation, um, there's a very real uh, influence, which is the impact of emotions. And so we now know through the work of Kahneman, Tversky, all these other guys, that there can be a real psychological burden on one's morale and uh, with losing money and gains don't have an equal and opposite boost. And so given this and given the prospect for, um, you know, runs with cards uh, on, on either side, um, how did you stick with the strategy after suffering bad losses? Did you ever let emotions lead you to act in an inconsistent way? And did you ever make any exceptions? Well, those are really good questions. So I'll tackle them uh, one at a time here. First, a- actually having played in a casino to address the questions you just raised was perfect training ground for much bigger scale betting on Wall Street. So one of the things I learned that I basically taught myself in the casino on a first big gambling trip was start small, just bet one to ten dollars and play until uh, it doesn't bother you anymore, until you can emotionally handle it. That took me eight hours of the 20 hours of warm up. And then when, after after that, I moved up to two to 20. That took about an hour. Then I moved to uh, five to 50. That took another hour and 25 to 300, another couple of hours and then 50 to 500. So I learned how to handle my emotions, how to be disciplined, how to stick to the system by starting small at a level where it didn't bother me and then gradually scaling up as I uh, learned that it worked, that I got confidence and so on. And so that was one thing I learned that was a valuable ever after when the scale became uh, uh, tens of even hundreds of millions of dollars on Wall Street. The other thing uh, that was very valuable was how to manage money. And so I came across something which later was impounded in a series of papers I wrote uh, called the uh, Kelly Criterion for uh, deciding how much to bet in favorable situations. And that that now has caught on with a lot of people. There's a big book that I co-edited with tons of math and papers that have been written over actually centuries that relate to this topic. It's called the Kelly Capital Growth Investment Criterion. It's put up by World Scientific. It has three editors, um, Bill Ziemba, uh, Leonard McLean, and myself. And we wrote several of the papers in there and a lot of the connected material. But it's a it's a math thing. You don't have to do a lot of work that we did. And so Ziemba is a great author, by the way, listeners. Um, but so let's talk about that real quick, because I think one of the biggest mistakes gamblers, but also investors make often in their bet sizing is they take way, way too much risk or exposure given, you know, the odds. You see people sit down at a blackjack table and they have a hundred dollar bankroll and they're playing with twenty dollar hands. And it doesn't matter, you know, even if they were counting in that regard, because you're gonna go bankrupt just because you have such a high bet size. And so for so let's expand real quick about thinking about risk and return um, in the Kelly criterion. And so its main goal is to it involves a way to determine the approximate wager or position size when you have a sort of known edge. And I wonder if you'll explain just simply for a bit for our listeners, is there kind of a shorthand version um, you could summarize that, uh, you know, investors can can put into context? Sure. Uh, The basic idea is that if you if you bet small in good situations, you won't, won't make very much money. If you bet really big, there's a chance you'll take such a big hit when something bad happens that you'll be ruined. So there's an intermediate level that works better than either of the extremes. And the Kelly criterion shows you how to calculate that intermediate level if you know the probabilities. And if you can only estimate them, then you can be somewhat conservative and still get a pretty good result from the Kelly system, even with a lack of important information. Many people 
don't understand uh, how to how to bet size. And Kelly, uh, the Kelly Criterion Theory shows you that if you bet too much, you'll almost certainly be ruined. And you might think that only applies to somebody sitting in a casino or somebody uh, managing a little portfolio, but it actually applies to everybody in a, a quite a dramatic way. Uh, later on in the book, I talk about various busts that we've had. It was the 29 crash. There was the SML scandal in the 80s. There was the market meltdown in, 1980s, in 1987. There was long-term capital management in 1998. And there was the big bust in 2008-2009. And one theme that runs through all these is excess leverage. And one thing the Kelly system tells you is how much leverage to use. And the amount of leverage that should have been used in all these situations is way less than the amount that people actually use. And so the Kelly system says when you lose, when you use too much leverage, you're going to blow up. You're trying to say the 100 to 1 of long terms is a little too much leverage? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, it's it's been eight years going on now since we've had in the bear market in the U.S. And it's funny because, you know, we'll talk about this in a second. But, you know, the biggest mistake we see, particularly younger investors make when when investing is they often having not experienced a loss or a devastating loss in general, they, they take on way too much risk. And financial advisors, we you know, we think make that mistake. Um, in general, for younger investors, they say put all your money into stocks. But the problem is you, you neglect the the emotional part is can someone sit through a 30 50 90 percent loss it's tough so all right so we get a little more on vegas i want to talk about you know one, one of the things that with any business or casinos is that once some find someone finds a way to take millions of dollars from you as in the case with wall street as well often the rules change and so vegas started changing the rules you started to get some chemicals in your coffee um there's even a, a pretty scary story about you know you, you didn't say it was guaranteed but your car accelerator getting stuck and then eventually they just straight up started banning you from the casino um and so, you know, the, the challenge is not necessarily just having a wi winning system. It's the threat of danger. The ca and, and even you also mentioned the casino ch outright cheating. Um, and then the rules change, ability to kick you out. So I'm curious. You started a couple times to change your appearance a little bit. What's did, did, was there was there the, a crazy? Did you have a craziest sort of costume at all? Um, I, I think one time you said maybe you shaved your beard or added a beard. What was the? Well, I, I didn't uh, go on many gambling trips because I'm not strongly money oriented. I'm more uh, life and people oriented. And uh, I'm interested in doing the kind of things that I want to do rather than just trying to accumulate stuff. I happen to be lucky and also accumulate stuff, but uh, that's just the way it worked out. In any case, I went on a few more gambling trips. And on one of them, I was, oh, a point I made was to always have somebody around that knew me. Uh, you know, to help guarantee my safety. So there was a couple I didn't know who uh, volunteered to come along on one of the trips. They were I had we had mutual friends, and so I decided to experiment with the disguise since I was having trouble getting a decent game looking like myself. So I grew a beard and I got contact lenses, and when I walked up to the hotel room where the people who were with me were staying. Uh, we were staying in the same hotel. I walked down the hall, knocked on their door. Uh, we met, we talked, we went to dinner. And then I played in this outfit with a uh, Hawaiian shirt and casual pants and so forth at a casino nearby in Reno. And I played for several hours. And I kept winning and winning. And eventually, the people in management came by one at a time to ID me and get a good look so that when they kicked me out, they would know not to let me back in again. And the dealer who was uh, was a young lady who was very interested in me because she saw a lot of money and she wanted to get together at 2 a.m. when her shift was off. Uh, we didn't do that. <laughs> my, my wife wanted me to ask you if you'd ever dressed up as a woman, but I, I'm, I'm guessing the, the, the answer to that is no. no um, <laughs> so so, so anyway, the, the punchline in the story is that they kicked me out about 1 a.m. and she was very disappointed. 
So then I shaved off my beard, uh, put on uh, fairly dressy uh, pants and dress, dress jacket, so forth. Put on sunglasses instead of the contact lenses and uh, came to knock on their door. And when they opened the door, they said, yes, they didn't recognize me. So I said, this is going to be good. So I went back to the same table in the same seat the next night. And as it happened, a parade of management started coming by to eyeball me. I thought eyeball me again, but they weren't looking at me. They were looking at the guy on my right. He was a player cheat who kept trying to either add chips to his file when he had a good hand, uh, add chips to his bet, or uh, draw chips off his bet when he had a bad hand. So they jawboned him and criticized him, and everybody came by to see who he was. They kicked him out after about an hour. I made sure that I only spoke in a whisper when they came by to offer me drinks, and I asked for milk. And I didn't uh, use my voice so that the dealer could hear it. It was the same dealer I had before, and she didn't recognize me. So I played on. I won all evening and left. So the disguise worked uh, very, very well in that instance. And I was, uh, I will say I was greatly entertained by that. It's funny, you know, so I, I ended up moving to Tahoe out of college, you know, with, along with a few friends, of course, it, it taught ourselves to count and it'd been mildly successful. I think we eventually figured our winnings were about minimum wage per hour. But the, the biggest challenge for me was that once we learned you know, you then become almost like a computer and the once you know that the game can get bit, get beat and you get kicked out of about five casinos, like the allure and fun for me, at least, was a little bit gone. And that all of a sudden now you're sitting at a blackjack table watching people just lose all of their money over and over, berate you for the terrible hands you're playing, yeah. smoking cigarettes. And it just wasn't a whole lot of fun, <laughs> you know, at that point. And, and one of the biggest challenges I, you know, added a buddy and we said, hey, let's let's play as a team. We can spread our bets, breadth, all that good stuff. And one of my favorite stories from him and, and why, you know, I eventually quit doing that is we came back after about an hour and I saw another of our buddies and I say, hey, how's 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 Chris doing? And then he said, oh, man, he's down a couple thousand. I said, how's that even possible? You, I don't even with the bet sizing we're doing. I don't think that's possible. He says, I don't know, but he's having a good time. I think he's had six Bloody Marys already. I said, <laughs> oh, OK, well, that, that makes sense. Um, we're going to skip over. So you got to go read the book if you want to hear about Ed's fascinating contribution to roulette building, building a wearable uh, computer. Uh, he talks about even thinking about Wheel of Fortune and Baccarat. And one question I wanted to have before we move on to the, the bigger casino is you don't ever mention either uh, sports gambling or poker. Were, the, were those games that you ever thought about or had an interest in or sure. at that time, uh, not so much? Let me start with poker. What I, I understood, uh, well, I read through a book called uh, The Mathematical Theory of Games and Economic Behavior by uh, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern, a classic a fundamental book on uh, mathematical style game theory. And poker is one of the favorite examples in that book. They're simplified examples that are worked out. And that launched a lot of people trying to figure out how to mathematically solve poker. And one of the intriguing things about poker is that you can mathematically analyze bluffing. So you can get a formula which will tell you in a given situation with what probability you should bluff, fold, call, or raise. So people have worked on this pretty hard for a long time. They finally, just now, have solved a two-person Texas Hold'em limit poker and I think they have a very good artificial intelligence program for Texas Hold'em no limit poker. It's not perfect, but apparently beats uh, human players. This is, has just happened. So anyhow, my analysis of all this, when I thought about it was, I could spend years studying poker and trying to get good at it, but then my life would be a poker analyst and a poker player, and that wasn't the kind of life I had any particular interest in. So I passed on poker because uh, it was too much work for what I was going to get back out of it. Yeah, uh, poker for me, I love playing, having a few beers, playing with friends, but sitting in a casino, same thing, it, like these tournaments that go on for like 10 hours, it's just, the, it's almost like torture to me. It's the most boring thing in the world. Anyway. Um, so the fundamental mm -hmm. question is, what kind of life do you want to have? And it wasn't the kind of life I wanted to have. But let me 
I mentioned sports betting. Uh, in the 90s, I happened to hire a PhD candidate in computer science who had a sports betting program. And it looked quite good to me. And there were a few ways to maybe simplify it a little bit and add just a little bit to it. And so uh, we gave it a try in Las Vegas. And we had a lady there betting for us, a uh, very smart, capable person. And she spent about five months uh, using the system. We had about a 6% edge. And we ran $50,000 up to $173,000. But I decided to kill the program because people who were carrying winning betting tickets were being killed and robbed in Vegas. And I didn't want to risk her person in an operation like that. So I basically just shut it down. It yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't worth it. Um, there's, there's definitely some unsavory characters. Well, let's, let's move on, um, to the even bigger casino, uh, wall street and investing. And so eventually you redirected your focus to the financial markets. And in the book you said, gambling is investing simplified. And so maybe you could talk a little bit what, uh, what you mean by that. Sure. In gambling, you put money down and there's an uncertain outcome and you get a payoff. Same thing in Wall Street, you put money down, uncertain outcome, you get a payoff. There are differences in details. Gambling is a much faster series of bets typically than on Wall Street. Not anymore, of course, with high, high frequency traders trading in uh, milliseconds and microseconds. But in the old days, humans uh, were not so uh, rapid in the way they did things. The difference between the casinos and Wall Street is more one of scale than anything else. And the fact that at least in some casino games, you can calculate odds very accurately, not all of them. In most Wall Street situations, you can only estimate. So if, if I were to ask you, for instance, where will the S&P 500 be Oh, where will a Dow be, let's say, at the end of uh, this year? So I could ask you what you think the midpoint estimate is. Probability half higher, probability half lower. You come up with something. Uh, if I ask someone else, they come up with a slightly different number and so forth. But we, we don't know. There's going to be a spread around that. And events could cause the spread to the outcome to be very, very far away from our estimate or very, very close. Typically, the estimate is, you know, in a given year, up 10% uh, over the course of a year, because that's what history has shown. But in many years, the move is far greater or far less. So on Wall Street, you're busy estimating things that you can't know exactly. Whereas in Blackjack, you can calculate the exact probability that the dealer, if he's honest, will deal you a Blackjack on the next hand. And, and so you, interestingly enough, picked an area that relies a little bit less on, um, say, forecasting and a little bit more on, uh, certainty is the wrong word, but, but the opportunity in arbitrage. And so, um, you know, so Ed started Convertible Hedge, which eventually became Princeton Newport, and concocted one of the near highest, if not risk-adjusted returns uh, over... 20 years plus another 10 with Ridgeline. Um, and when, and Prince of Newport had something like no down years and three down months, I think, um, or three down, no, three down months, I think. Um, so you talk a little bit about that strategy, uh, that you implemented and, and as, as a gazillion readers always were interested if that's something they could still replicate today. Okay. A lot of questions there. Uh, let me tackle one at a time. First, the record of Prince of Newport, we ran a for, as I recall, 230 months, and we had three down months. They were 1% or less. All the other months were winning. All the quarters were winning. All the years were winning. And we annualized before fees at a little over 19%. The Dow did about uh, half that. So lots of people have had records in profits that good. Uh, few, if any, have had such a low risk associated with that kind of a record. And the way we got that low risk was that I specialized in hedging securities that were mispriced against each other. 
uh, securities in the same company. So I might, for instance, buy a convertible bond in a company and sell short options against that bond if I thought the bond was underpriced. And then the underlying risk of the company price changing would largely be hedged away. And so then I built a portfolio of a very large number of these things. And as money became available or as uh, positions were cashed out, I put more of them on. And then we developed and branched out into other profit areas like index arbitraging and locking in profits in uh, futures markets and so forth. But always things in which the risk was hedged away as much as I could. And when you had a portfolio in which each little part had most of its risk hedged away, what was left was a diversification among many low-risk things, and the total risk would kind of wash out by the law of large numbers. So that's why the returns were so, so stable over this time. And so here's an interesting, there's nothing that breeds competition more than success. And so you had a really long, successful track record. And um, you talk in the book about, you know, eventually having conversations and helping to start um, firms like Ken Griffin Citadel as one of the first LPs or first LP and then D.E. Shaw and a bunch of others. One of the questions I have, so, you know, if you look up a lot of these multi-factor models today or even the gazillion hedge funds, you often see, you know, you pull up a stock and, and AQR owns it, D.E. Shaw owns it, yada, yada, all the way down, LSV owns it. Let's say you have a system that has an edge, you know, how do you, and, and it starts to degrade or do poorly. Um, and this is, I actually struggle with this and, and, I don't know that I have a great answer. Is it how do you know when it's time to put a system to pasture versus say when it's in a drawdown that it's actually time to to invest more in the belief that it's a mean reversion sort of opportunity? Is that is that something um, you could comment about? Sure, that that's a uh, hard question that many people founder on over the years, and the way I've addressed it is if I if I'm doing something that I think gives me an edge, I ask to myself, did it work in the past? Is it working now? Do I think it's going to work in the future? And I want to know what the mechanism is that's driving it. For instance, somebody who is a commodity trend follower and doing pretty well right now, uh, worked for, for a couple of years, and we worked on various systems for trading commodities. And they did, they had mixed results but on the whole, somewhat good. But I said to myself, I'm afraid to invest in this thing in a big way because I will never know if when I have a significant drawdown, whether it's just bad luck, you know, random chance. I'll come back and explain what I mean by that in a minute. Or whether something has changed and things don't work anymore. Let me go back to the random chance thing. If you have something that uh, trends upward, historically, like let's say the S&P 500, and let's say it goes up 10% a year. There are random fluctuations around that, and some of them are fairly large. If you have an idea of the level of the random fluctuations, then you can tell whether something is really extraordinarily out of line or not. Same in blackjack. Uh, it's, I learned that early in the casinos. If I have a certain edge, I can tell uh, by comparing my results with the with the amount I should have made on average, whether what's happening is extraordinarily bad, so bad that it suggests something else is going on, like uh, cheating, for instance, or sometimes it's extraordinarily good. Maybe a dealer is uh, throwing cards my way. I've never seen that happen, but uh, were the extraordinarily good, I'd also uh, question that. In any case, you need to understand what the underlying average result ought to be and how much normal chance fluctuations, uh, down is bad luck, up is good luck, how much that uh, can be, and then see whether what is happening is outside that range. And if it is, then you want to know why. So anyhow, if you don't have a reason for knowing why something works, then if it goes bad, you don't know whether it's bad luck or whether something changed. Yeah, and, and we often talk about uh, in on the podcast about how important it is to at least understand history, even if you're a buy and hold investor. Um, you know, and, and we talk often about uh, as an equity investor, you need to be able to accept 
50, like, like you mentioned in the thirties, the stock market went down over 80% and ask anyone in Russia, Brazil, Greece, et cetera. Um, but a lot of people may acknowledge that fact, but then of course, when it happens, they, they don't believe that it's, it's really happening and so are unprepared for it. Um, all right. So I want to, I want to hit a few more topics before, uh, we only have you for so long today. So over your career, you mentioned you, you did all sorts of trading, convertible, Warren Arb, thrift, thrift conversion, futures Arb, stat Arb, multi-factor models, trend following all this stuff. Um, do you have a most memorable trade over, you know, the last 40 plus years? Well, one of my favorites, uh, there are quite a few I mentioned in the book, but one, one of my favorites was uh, some warrants I bought way back in the early 70s. When I first learned about warrants, when I was educating myself about the market, I had a little, uh, got a little book which told about how once in a while you'd buy warrants for pennies and they'd be worth dollars. You'd make a uh, uh, hundred times your money. And I thought, I've done a lot of warrant trading, I thought that would never happen to me. But um, we picked up some warrants uh, for something like 27 cents a warrant. I have the exact numbers in the book. And we got about 10,800 of them uh, for, and the stock, underlying stock was, I think, $8. So being a hedger, I, I hedged even this tiny amount uh, on which we spent uh, just a few thousand dollars. And the stock went down to something like one and a half. So I covered the stock which paid for the entire cost of the position, left a small profit at a couple thousand dollars. And the warrants were so cheap, I said uh, to my partner, just you know, put them in a the box and leave them there. They don't expire for another 10 years or so. So we did. And then uh, time went by a couple of years and we started getting phone calls. I wanted to buy our warrants. And we looked and we saw, oh, the stock's moved up. It's like 10 or 15 now. They wanted to pay us maybe three or four dollars. And I said, no, it's it's, it's not enough, uh, not enough. The warrants are worth more than that. And as the stock moved up, the warrants became uh, more and more valuable theoretically. And the people who wanted to buy it kept raising their offer, but never enough. So I said, just you know, sit on them. Pretty soon the stock got to 40, which was the exercise price for the warrants. So now they're moving into the money. And then the stock kept moving up. The stock finally moved up to, I think, 180 or so. And the warrants were carried up along with it. And so we sold these 10,000 warrants uh, on the way up, mostly near the top, at, uh, for a profit of more than a million dollars. And the company was sort of interesting. It was the something called the Mary Carter Paint Company. And they had purchased a bunch of land down in the Bahamas. They decided to see if they could erect a casino down there. And they got early permission to do that. And they changed the name to Resorts International. And that was the cause of all the action in the warrants and the great explosion in the price of the company. So anyhow, that, that was fun to see that happen. I, I love it. You should have completed the circle by then going down to the casino and taking them for millions of dollars and making the stock go down. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought for sure you might have said the trade where you bought part of an oil tanker with Bruce Kovner, the Empress de Mers. But I, you, readers or listeners are going to have to read the book to hear about that story. It's pretty awesome. All right, we're going to do a couple super quick questions. Um, we only have you for about 10 more minutes or so. Um, the great story in the book is you talk about getting to meet uh, Warren Buffett, so who everyone's going to be familiar with. And you, you said you later told your wife that you thought he'd be one day the richest man in America. What what did you see in Buffett in that meeting or that time that kind of led you to that conclusion? Well, I learned that he had started in the stock market when he was something like 11 years old, and he was devoted to it and extremely knowledgeable. And he'd already made a lot of money at that point. He was worth about $25 million at the point I met him, and that was back in 1968. Now, in 1982, it took $100 million to get on the Forbes 400 list. Uh, 25 million in 1968 probably would have gotten him on if they'd had that list then. Forbes, of course, didn't know about him and they didn't discover him until 1965 when he was well up the list. Uh, pardon me, 1985 when he was well up the list. They'd been running for three years before they even knew he was around. But uh, he was uh, smart and knowledgeable. He was good with numbers. He understood long-term compounding, and he was going to spend his life doing it. And he was an encyclopedia of information. So I thought he had everything it took, and he'd already gone uh, very far when I met him. 
although few people except his investors and immediate friends knew how far he'd already come. You know, it's it's interesting. We talk a lot about Buffett and have done a ton of modeling that just goes and tracks his holdings through public 13F filings and show that you could easily beat the market by a mile just by following his holdings once a quarter in, in when they come out publicly delayed. Um, but at the same time, like anyone and like any strategy, he goes through these periods of under and out performance. And so it's something like his stock picks, his long stock picks, not Berkshire, has underperformed the market eight of the last 10 years. But if you go back to 2000, he's outperformed the market on those stock picks by something like 5% a year, which would have beaten 99% of all mutual funds. And just to goes to show a lot of people's edge, and in his case, I think, for example, is that is his ability to to stick to his system, you know, much like you talk about in Blackjack, uh, where he says, look, this is what I do and realize there's going to be times of, of underperformance and not changing his whole approach when when markets are down or, or he's doing poorly okay a couple more really quick questions um and then we'll let you go um one twitter question that we got like in six different variants was if you could give a, a piece of investing advice to say a child grandchild you know maybe with a, a slant towards kind of what's the best strategy for the average investor to grow wealthy what what, what would you say for the average investor he shouldn't spend his time uh and life trying to uh, uh, beat the stock market, he should just buy a no-load, low-fee index fund like you know Vanguard, S&P 500, or uh, VTSAX. I love it. That's easy. That's great advice. We, uh, <laughs> we certainly sympathize with that. Um, a couple other ones, non-necessarily finance-related, and we'll let you go. Um, you talk a lot about I'm sure you get asked a ton about gambling, investing, written multiple books now. So you must enjoy the writing process. Um, could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, are, are you a regimented writer? or what, what, What's your sort of writing routine? Well, what I do is I make an outline of what I'm going to write. And I think about the outline and decide if this is really what I want to write about and how I want to do it. And then I begin to flesh in the outline. And then I finally get uh, a piece, a draft piece. After that, I look at it and think about it for a while and decide how to try to improve the writing, the quality of the writing. And as uh, one friend said, all writing is really rewriting. And I find that with each pass, I can make the sentence structure better. I get a few more ideas. Uh, it becomes more conversational and so forth. I think that's true. You know, my experience has always been to have a total amount of writer's block and panic and then to go totally insane and kind of write it all at the same time. But the, but the first draft is, you know, so many people think that's the most work, but it's really <laughs> 200 rewrites after that. So uh, you've said, I've seen recently a note that you're thinking about or maybe decided to be frozen uh, once you pass on and, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, once science is caught up, it seems like in, you know, many ways, everything you do is about defying the odds and improving that the impossible is anything. But um, what sort of odds do you think in here? Uh, and and, and what, what, what year do you think that the, the science may catch up if you had to give us give us an estimate? Uh, there's no telling. I think the probabilities are perhaps as low as 2% in succeeding. But uh, they could be much higher. It's a subjective thing, and there's no way of estimating. It could be 50 or 60 percent. Uh, as far as how long it takes, it's a matter of how science rolls forward, at what pace, and that's a very uncertain thing, difficult to forecast. Which which areas of science will move faster, and which uh, not so fast. So I think uh, one could be in storage for anywhere from 50 to uh, 200 years. It seems like a call option, right? Uh, not not a whole lot of downside, really only upside. So even at a 50 to 1, it's not too bad. My, my uncle, who is a pilot and an engineer, uh, always uh, gives his kids a ton of anxiety by saying he's written in his will that he wants to be stuffed um, and put into a, a night uh, coat of arms in the hallway and they, they have to do that in his house and they, they spend most of the time at Christmas worrying if he's actually really put that in the will. Um, well, it's, more it, it's something like what you, uh, what you mentioned is something like, uh, uh, well, you mentioned a call option. There's the Resorts International uh, warrants that I bought a long time ago. I'd say it's something like that purchase. 
My so in your book, bo- the same way. Right. <laughs> in your book, um, you touched on kind of that. There's a consistent theme that you know. I, I found so refreshing because you see so much on Wall Street, so many people are so obsessed, you know, with just the dollar and with just money. And with all this behavioral research, you spend so much time people thinking about how to make money. And then there's been a lot of good books like Happy Money and some others that say that people are actually really fairly terrible at optimizing on how to spend it. So they make all the money and they do all the wrong things. They buy a bunch of yachts and things that, that may not necessarily, you know, kind of drive the happiness. And so in, in the book, you you touched on a, a, an example of re- uh, referencing J. Paul Getty and and said, you know, super wealthy, but the happiest he ever was when he was 16 surfing in Malibu. And just one last question I want to talk, you know, maybe you can mention, um, because I think it's great for a lot of the younger investors and quants, you know, as they think about their life, you know, how how did the success at your funds really, uh, you know, as the years went on, affect your perspectives on the source of real happiness? Well, I've, I've thought that the important thing in life is how you spend your time, who you spend it with, and what you do. And money is something which can make that uh, much more agreeable and pleasant and make you much happier. But I don't think it's an end in itself. What you, should, you should do what you want to do and what you like to do. And I think uh, good things will follow. We put a great quote in my first book by the climber George Mallory, and then it's it's been on the blog ever since. And it says, um, "Enjoy is after all the end of life. We do not eat to live and make money. We eat and make money to be able to live. That is what life means and what life is for." Um, one of my favorite quotes. Ed, um, one more question for you, and then we're going to let you go. I saw somewhere that you said, um, "I know you're a rational, science-based guy. You've never bought a lottery ticket. Is that still true?" Uh, I bought. Five lottery tickets once when the pool was so large carried over that I had an edge. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm wanted to thank you for coming on today. So we said we were going to alleviate the pain of you making a negative expectancy bet. So I picked up two Powerball tickets on the way to work. Um, you Do you want the first entry or the second? Because I'm going to take the other one. <laughs> okay, I'll take the first one. All right. First one, just so um, listeners can hold us accountable. It's tonight's drawing. I think it's 200 million. Your numbers are 25, 28, 37, 41, 62, and Powerball of 20. Ed, good luck on that, by the way. Um, You've been a gentleman. I would love to keep you here for six more hours and ask 100 more questions, but I know you have wonderful, better things to do. Thank you much, uh, so much for uh, taking the time today. A pleasure. Thank you, man. Um, listeners, uh, thanks for listening. We always welcome feedback and questions to the mailbag at feedback at the com. As a reminder, you can always find the show notes and other episodes at mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review. We'll have a link to the book. A Man for All Markets, From Las Vegas to Wall Street, How I Beat the Dealer in the Market with Ed Thorpe. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Today's podcast is sponsored by the ride-sharing app Lyft. While I only live about two miles from work, my favorite means of getting around traffic-clogged Los Angeles is to use the various ride-sharing apps, and Lyft is my favorite. Today, if you go to lyft.com forward slash invite forward slash meb, you get a free $50 credit to your first rides. Again, that's lyft.com forward slash invite forward slash meb.